For loops are something that we use almost every single day in JavaScript, but are you writing them in the most efficient way? Let's take a look at five tips for writing better for loops in JavaScript. What's up everyone? My name is James Q Quick and I do weekly videos on web development related topics and do a lot with vanilla JavaScript and helping people learn JavaScript, especially early on in their career. So I wanted to take a few minutes short video today to talk about how to improve your for loops, how to write better for loops. So it's a couple of different tips from a couple of different perspectives of how to write them efficiently in terms of performance, in terms of actually writing the code, et cetera. So we'll just kind of dive in. And I'm curious, as you have thoughts or additional questions along the way, make sure to leave those in the comments below. Maybe we'll do follow up videos with extra tips. Or if you feel like there's tips that I'm missing that you would like me to include or talk about in the future, I'll leave those in the comments as well. So uh, let's get started with number one. Now I am inside of uh, VS Code. I'm, I'm using an extension called Quokka. And what Quokka allows me to do is to create a JavaScript file where I can uh, kind of live run code. So this is going to say, uh, hello, Jello world. Jello world should be a thing. So it'll kind of show you what, uh, what the output is from the code as it's running, as well as show you down here. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not going to save that one. All right. So we've got five different things in here. Now, I'm going to start with an array. Uh, and usually the most typical use case for a for loop is working with arrays. Uh, so we want to iterate through something. So let's say we want to write a for loop to iterate through uh, each one of these cars in this array and then um, and then just log it out. Uh, so what you typically probably do is you do for uh, let i equals zero i less than uh, you can stop me and fast forward if you've written this a million times or I, if I can even type this cars dot length, uh, I plus plus see how fumbly that is. Uh, and I still have another typo. So this should be a comma, uh, actually not a comma, a semicolon. if I can do any of this stuff correctly. So there's your basic for loop. You can tell I, maybe it's just me like getting this syntax right as you're typing is annoying and tricky and all these things. So the first tip, tip here is to use code snippets. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you what I have. So inside of VS Code, I think you'll have a for loop uh, thing by default. So if I come down, uh, I think this is the default one. So, uh, or maybe this is the one I created, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, so this is a snippet. So what happens is I type in F-O-R and then I get a couple of different uh, options here of uh, snippets that'll write the majority of this code for me. So these also use tab stops, which are really cool, which means that see that index is selected in multiple places. So if I type in I, it's going to replace index in all those locations. And then if I tab, it'll go to the next series of tab stops, tab stops, uh, hence the name. And so now it's array. So the array here is going to be cars. And then uh, the only thing I don't have, which I should have done a tab stop for this is to rename this element uh, to car. And then in this case, I can just uh, log this out. Uh, and so you can see it is now logging out uh, each one of these cars here. So the uh, the first tip here for writing for loops is to not actually write for loops yourself, use code snippets. And I think there's one built in. We also have, uh, if we search in the command palette in VS Code, uh, configure user snippets, and you can go down to uh, JavaScript. You can see this is where I've defined my snippet. Now I'd like to do more videos on like helpful snippets. So if you have helpful snippets that you use in JavaScript that you created yourself, let me know those in the comments below. I'd love to see those. But you can see that it has the body for the for loop, and then we use the tab stop. So notice uh, dollar $index, dollar $index. That's the name, and that's how it associates this tab stop, all these tab stops to be one. And then you can see the tab stop of array is one here. And then all I would have to do is add another tab stop for element to fix uh, the thing that I just talked about. So if I were to do this again and did uh, I for the index, uh, cars for the array and then tab. Now I get uh, my thing and then I can also do another tab stop to come down to the next line. Anyway, the short of this is use code snippets. Writing for loops yourself sucks. It's not fun. Use code snippets to do it for you. Number two is the accumulator pattern. Now this is something that you'll use in all sorts of data structures and uh, or just like whiteboarding challenges, some variation of the accumulator pattern. This is one of the most common patterns I think that is out there, the accumulator pattern may just calling it a pattern, I feel like sounds uh, intimidating, but it's not. And we're going to kind of take a look at uh, how and why. So in this case, let's say we want to do a letter count for the letters in this really long word. Now I found this word because I Googled really long word in English and it gave me this word. So I just put it into a string. 
And so let's say we wanted to uh, grab for each one of these letters, P for example, how many P's are in this word? How many N's are in this word, E, et cetera. Now the solution to this is to use a, uh, an object or it's kind of like a map in uh, objects in JavaScript are kind of like a map, but it's separate from the actual map thing. So uh, we'll just use the, uh, the built-in object and we'll just start with an empty object like this. So the accumulator pattern idea is where you start off with something here kind of an empty version of the thing that you want to build up. You want to accumulate things inside of it by iterating through uh, some sort of uh, some sort of ray, characters in a word, etc. So I can uh, go through and uh, do in for r again, and I can say i, and then now uh, we can use our word.length, and then we'll take our uh, letter. Cool, so we're iterating through the actual word here. And then what we want to do is we want to add a count uh, for the associated uh, letter. So we can first check if there uh, if there is not a property already set for word count of letter. So if there's not something already there, then we can set word count of letter to be one to say, hey, we found one letter. Uh, otherwise, we can say word count at letter and uh, do plus plus. All right, so that's how we'll keep track of this. At the end, uh, we will uh, log out the word count just to see that we get something. I think that code is right. We are not differentiating between capital and lowercase. We'd have to look into that, but I think that's right. But the point here is accumulator pattern is a very common pattern to use in for loops where you start off with some sort of default value, empty value of something that you want to accumulate or build up as you iterate through your for loop. So you initialize that thing to start you update and add things to it as you go through, and then you uh, have your final result in the end. All right, number three is short circuiting. And uh, it's a pretty uh, straightforward idea where if you're going through, if you're looping through something and you find the thing that you're looking for, you find the answer to the question, the reason you're iterating through the for loop, you don't need to continue to iterate through the rest of the array, rest of the characters in, uh, in a string, et cetera. So let's actually start with uh, the four R again, and uh, we're just gonna iterate through the cars again. So cars here, then we get our car. Cool. So the same basic for loop, let's say our goal is to check if the array contains, uh, let's say BMW. And just so you're aware, back all the way up here, uh, here's the different car, it's just a random list of cars. Uh, so we have car uh, BMW in here, and it happens to be in the third position. So zero, one, two as the zero based index. So if we want to check to see if this thing exists, we could say uh, if car equals uh, BMW, that's the thing that we want to uh, check, we can log out, uh, found it. And you can see it logs out, found it. Uh, you can see we get it down here. Let's get rid of the logging for this one. All right, so we're only working on the problem that we're currently working on. And, uh, but if you notice, what we'll see is that uh, if we log out the car, we're actually gonna iterate through every single car. So if we look all through here, you'll see we do this one, this one, BMW, then say found it, then do the rest of these cars. There's really no need to uh, go through the rest of these. So what we can do is we can say, if we found it, we can just do a break. So now after we find that car, it'll break, it'll stop going through this for loop. Now this, uh, this, like potentially has efficiency implications in your application, especially if you get into something with nested loops as an example. Uh, but uh, you basically just don't wanna waste computer cycles on this and it makes for cleaner code to go ahead and break and make sure it's clear that like after this condition is met, we don't need to go ahead and do the rest of this. So that's a little tip is after you've met some sort of condition, you know whether or not the answer to the question is true or false or whatever the answer is, go ahead and break out. There's no need to iterate through the rest of those items. Now here's a fun one. And this go is similar to the idea of number one. Number one was like, don't write for loops yourself. Number four here is don't write for loops. And this is actually very common with modern uh, JavaScript, ES6 JavaScript as of ES 2015. I always get confused how those numbers associate with each other. But we got introduced to array functions in JavaScript a few years ago. And so now we can use these. So we have things like maps. So let's say we wanna get the first letter of each um, of each car into an array. So instead of having a, an array of the car model or make models makes models themselves, we just want to take the first letter of each. So we can say first letters, and we're going to take our cars array, 
cars. Uh, we're going to map over each car. And then for each car, what do we want to return into this new array that we're working with? Well, we want to take uh, car dot, uh, we can actually just do car of zero, I think, and then log out uh, first letters. So this is just an easy way to transform. Let's log, get rid of these as well. So we're only looking at the one we're currently looking at. So map is an easy way to translate each item in an array to some other form um, of that item in a new array. So you get a copy, uh, you get your, get a new array with the data that you're looking for in the transformed way. So the alternative to this is you would have to do uh, first letters array, set that to an empty array, go through uh, the for loop. So we'll do for i cars, uh, cars, and then do car. And then we would have to uh, first letter array dot push and take car of zero. So those would do the equivalent thing, but the syntax here obviously makes it a lot nicer. All right, so that is the map function. There's a bunch of other ones, filter, reduce, find, sum, any, I think there's a lot of them. Anyway, they're very, very useful. You'll see in modern JavaScript, people very rarely write actual for loops anymore. Most of the time they will use, uh, or a lot of the time they will use array functions. So very common. Definitely recommend investing in those. Uh, the last one here is to be careful with async await. And this gets into actually like a, probably the biggest performance implication in terms of efficiency uh, of these tips, which is if you're uh, using async await inside of a for loop, that means that they are going sequentially, meaning you have to finish loading all the data here before you go through the next cycle of the for loop to load the next piece of data, et cetera, et cetera. What would be better is to eventually use promise.all to have them all run, not in parallel, I get pushback for using that word. Technically the word is, I believe, concurrently. So you're able to make requests for whatever information that you need concurrently instead of one after another, which does save time. Now the example of this is, not in that file, but in this one. So uh, I have a uh, video that you can check out on building a Pokedex with JavaScript, or excuse me, a Pokemon memory match game. Did this go away? Maybe I close this. Let me pull this back up with the go live extension, live server extension. And so what this is, it will use the uh, Pokemon API to load Pokemon and then turn this into a memory match game. I think this is super fun. Figure out how to build it in that video if you want to check it out. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple of functions. We have a load Pokemon slow function and then a load Pokemon function. Now, basically what this, what both of these do is they use this URL. So this URL and then adding on a number at the end will grab information about that Pokemon. The first one should be Bulbasaur that you can see here. So it's going to create uh, an array, actually a set of IDs, unique IDs of eight Pokemon that it can get. Go and query the information for each one of those Pokemon. Use that information to display in the game. And uh, so let's start with the Pokemon slow. So let me come down to our reset game function. And let's call load Pokemon slow here. And uh, we build up the array or the set of random IDs. We convert that to an array. Those are the IDs of the Pokemon that we want to go and get data for. And now we want to make a fetch request for each one of those. So we're doing this inside of a for loop, which means for each Pokemon, we have to load all the data about that Pokemon, add it to the array before we then go and start to load the information for the next Pokemon. So let's just say this, uh, save this. Let's open up the console. We'll get a couple of examples. So this is about 370 milliseconds. We refresh, now it is 380 and 385 and 340. So let's say somewhere around, that one was a lot longer. Let's say somewhere around the 350, 375 is the average of those, except for this last one that was a lot longer. Uh, so that's the slow version where again, we're having to wait to load all the data for each Pokemon before going on to the next one. Now the alternative is to use something called promise.all. Now promise.all allows you to take an array of promises and let them go out and do their thing concurrently, more or less at the same time. Technically there's like some switching and thing, things that go on behind the scenes, but you can think of these as all of these going on at the same time. So again, if you have questions on promise.all, you wanna know more about this, let me know. Maybe I'll do a dedicated video about it, maybe a five minute video. But by using promise.all here, 
and not using the traditional array syntax, we actually could use a different syntax, but I'm combining it with a map where we take each one of these fetches, which returns a promise, and we convert that to promises. Then we await promise.all, all of those. And then we take those and convert them to the actual JSON uh, responses, which is the actual Pokemon. So if we are to switch this now and run the load Pokemon regular version, again, slow was like 350 milliseconds. Now we'll see 108 milliseconds, 71, 67, 69, et cetera. So obviously some very big performance implications here. Now, the other thing to note here is that it's not necessarily a difference between using regular for loops and then the map function. You'll still have similar issues if you were to do map and use async await inside of the map itself. So it's important to know that it's not just about the type of array or using traditional arrays versus array functions or for loops versus array functions. It's about how you leverage, in this case, your async awaits combined with promise at all to save a bunch of time. So those are five tips for writing better for loops in JavaScript. Let me know again, what are your thoughts? What did I miss? What extra suggestions that you do you have? I'd love to actually see those, maybe do some follow-up content on it. So let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you're ready to go write better for loops and I'll catch you in the next one.